One popular kind of game that families like to play together are trivia games, basically based upon how much you know. In fact, one of the most popular board games ever made was Trivial Pursuit. It came out in the early 80s. I remember playing it with my parents when I was in high school. This is the family version, Trivial Pursuit Family Edition. It has questions for kids and it has questions for adults. And you go around the board and you're trying to get pieces of the pie for all the different kinds of questions that, that you can answer. But, but trivia games are very popular. Think about TV game shows that are basically trivia games. The most popular TV show ever, Jeopardy, came out in the 60s, I think, and families today still like to gather around and see if they can get the question out first before Alex can say it. Uh, or you may remember, who wants to be a millionaire? Who wants to be a millionaire was a trivia question, and, and you were asked a question as you went up the... the value of the questions got more until the last one was worth a million dollars. But the, the neat thing that the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire show had is that you had these lifelines that you could use, basically ways of getting hints. And you had to decide whether you want to use them early on or save them for later. And, but one of them was phone a friend. So if you got a question you didn't know the answer to, you could phone a friend. And you had someone on standby and you would actually call them and they'd give you a minute or so to read the question and the answer, and then your friend could tell you what they thought the right answer was. They had to discontinue the phone of friend about 10 years ago because they figured out all the friends were, were Googling the question, and so they had to stop doing that. But, but I remember when I was a kid growing up, one of the things I noticed that was different about the family edition than the, the main edition is the family edition on the answer side doesn't have the references for where they got the answers from. The original edition used to have the, the references of how they know that because I remember as a family, we would spend more time arguing over the answer than we did playing the game. And the thing that we said more than anything else was, well, how do they know that? Well, welcome to week two of Foundations, a discipleship community. We are encouraging our church to have this 12-week-long conversation, thinking deeply about the foundations of our faith. Who is God? What's this world that he created and, and about the kingdom that he's forming? Last week, we talked about worldview and the importance of having a, a well-thought-out biblical worldview. Today, we just want to look at the question of how, do we know, how can we know anything about a God that we can't see? Or, you know, how do you know that's true? In today's age, of course, if you don't know something, what do you do? Is you just Google it, and you can pretty much find the answer for anything by on a search engine but of course what we're finding out is just because your search engine gives you back that result doesn't necessarily mean that you can trust it or that's trustworthy we're still asking the question how do we know so how do we know anything about a god that we cannot see well from a biblical worldview uh, the book of romans talks about how one of the ways that we know about god and before we read romans 1 you know the, the quick answer to this question is well you read the bible and I want us to think a little bit more deeply about why it is that we turn to the Bible to answer this question, how can we know anything about God? So Romans 1 says that what can be known about God is plain to us because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So what Romans 1, the Apostle Paul is telling us, one of the ways that we know about God is through creation itself, through the creation that God made. And specifically saying that through creation, one of the things that we know is that God is eternal. In other words, if God created everything out of nothing, that means he pre-existed creation. And God was not created by someone else, because if he was created by someone else, that something else would be God. So God is the uncreated creator. He has eternal. Also, it tells us that he has a divine nature. God created everything out of nothing. You and I don't have the power to create something out of nothing. We can make furniture, but we can go get some two-by-fours and nail them together, but you can't make your own two-by-four. You've got to go to a tree to get some wood. But God can create out of nothing, so he has a divine nature. And also, he has eternal power. God has much more power than you have. And so scripture tells us one of the ways that we know God is through creation. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and day by day they are pouring forth speech, telling us about the beauty and greatness of God. So one way we know about God is through creation itself. Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul adds to that 
and talks about how there is a, a law that is written on our heart. And what Paul is talking about in Romans 2 is the fact that if you're human, you've been made in the image of God, and that means because you're made in God's image, you are a moral agent. And what that means is you understand that there is right and there is wrong. Now, you might get into a debate with somebody about the specifics of what is right and what is wrong, but to be human is to understand and agree that there is right and there is wrong. And where does this come from? Why are all humans, why do we have a law written on our heart that says that there's right and that there's wrong? Because this is the way that God made us. And what does that tell us about the God who made us? Is that God is a moral being. God made us in His image. We have a moral agency about us that God is moral, which means there is a right and there is a wrong. He is the moral ruler of the universe. And so creation itself and even our humanity tells us about God and gives us some things that we can know about God. Theologians, we talk about this, we call this general revelation, that God has revealed himself generally through creation to all of humanity. But we can't know specifically about God just through general revelation. We don't know exactly about God's character. We don't know exactly of how we can have a relationship with God. We don't know what God wants from us. We don't know what's going to happen after we die. We, we don't know those specifics about God through general revelation. Those are the things we know because God has chosen to reveal them to us. So Hebrews chapter 1 is one of the most significant paragraphs in Scripture that talk about how it is that we can know something about God. So this is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son. And so what this is saying is God has been revealing Himself to us so that we can know the specifics about who He is and how we have a relationship with Him and what He wants from us. And so it says that God was revealing Himself at many times and in many ways. In theologians, we call this specific revelation. It's God is specifically revealing who He is. So, for instance, God has been revealing Himself through events in biblical history, particularly events of how God was relating to His people, the Jewish people. You think specifically about uh, the Hebrews that were in Egypt and how God liberated them out of Egypt in an event that we think of as the Exodus. But think about how God was revealing Himself to His people through the Exodus experience, specifically through the Passover, that they were going to be saved by God's wrath, by the blood of a lamb, that God was already revealing to them that through the sacrifice that they can be delivered and they can be saved, how God was revealing specifically about his nature and his character. You think about uh, the parting of the Red Sea and crossing on dry ground, how that specifically reveals his, his power and his sovereignty over creation. And then God specifically spoke to them through, writer of Hebrews says, through our fathers, through the generations that have come before us. God revealed himself. For instance, you think about Moses at the burning bush as God revealed himself to Moses and then gave to Moses the law, specifically revealing this is who I am and this is what I want from my people. This is what it means to be the people of God. But also God spoke through the prophets. I think of Moses and Samuel, but... Isaiah and Jeremiah and Elijah, where the word of the Lord comes to these prophets and these prophets speak that word to his people so that the people can know specifically about God as God reveals himself. But the writer of Hebrews is very clear. In the past, God has made himself known through events in history and speaking through prophets, but in the last days, he's made himself known by sending his son, Jesus, what we think of as the Incarnation. And we'll talk more specifically about the Incarnation in the weeks to come. But God reveals Himself to us by sending His Son. God becomes flesh. Jesus dwelt among us. And it's through that revelation of Himself that we really come to know about God's steadfast love, about God's mercy, about God's love for sinners, about God being a, a just God. We come to know God through the revelation of the Incarnation. But of course, it always comes back to the question, well, but how do we know? And we read about these things in Scripture. Scripture is our source. Scripture is where we go to. We don't, we don't go to Google. We go to the Scriptures to find out the truth. So we're back to the same question. 
How do we know anything about a God that we can't see? Why should we believe the scriptures to be a, a valid source to build a biblical worldview upon our faith? And so we come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, this very key verse that says, All scripture is breathed out by God, or all scripture is inspired. All scripture is God's breath, and it's profitable for teaching for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And so that scripture tells us about the Word of God. It says that the Word of God is inspired. And when we talk about inspiration, what we're talking about is the supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit upon the scripture writers, which rendered the writings that they produced as an accurate representation of the Word of God so that the scriptures become the word of God. Our understanding of scripture is that God was speaking through the scripture writers so that what they wrote was actually the word of God. You may have heard words like uh, inerrancy applied to scripture. What, what they're trying to capture with that word is that a scripture presents truth without any mixture of error, that what scripture says is true and can be trustworthy. We also talk about how scripture has authority behind it. So the scripture writers, all of the scripture writers were either apostles or closely associated with apostles, which means they were eyewitnesses to Jesus himself. And the writings that they wrote were used in the early church and they were consistent with what the, what the disciples and the apostles were teaching about Jesus. And so that was consistent with the orthodox gospel. And so we can trust them to be a, an accurate and authoritative representation of the word of God. It also tells us that Scripture is profitable. It's profitable for teaching. So it teaches us what is right and what is wrong. It's profitable for correcting. So when we wander off the path, it's to correct us and get us back to the path of life. It's also profitable for training in righteousness. What does it mean to live a righteous life? And it's also profitable to equip us to do the good work that God has created us to do. That Scripture is how God has revealed Himself to us. Now, that's a lot of words to say about Scripture, and you do kind of ask the question, why do we believe this about Scripture? Well, the short answer is we believe this about Scripture because this is how Jesus and the apostles viewed Scripture themselves. So one of the interesting things in the book of Acts, when uh, the believers quoted Scripture, when they quoted the Old Testament, listen to how they quoted it. So for Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 16, it says, Brother, the Scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. And I was talking about Judas. And then it goes in and quotes from the Psalms. In other words, they understood the Scripture writings were the Holy Spirit speaking through the mouth of the Scripture writer. And what result of that is the Scriptures become the inspired Word of God. This is God's breath. They are breathed out by God. The Holy Spirit breathed through the scripture writer, and what is recorded is the Word of God. This is why the Bible is so important to us in our faith. When we talk about a biblical worldview, we are building the foundations upon our faith about our understanding of who God is and the world that He made and the kingdom that He's creating, that all of that is informed to us through the scriptures. And so we encourage you to consider the, the next step activities here on the webpage. Uh, there's some articles there to encourage you to continue to read about the idea of why we should trust the Bible and things about inspiration and errancy, some of those words that we use and how Scripture is profitable. There's uh, companion videos presented by our children's ministry so that you can have these conversations with your children so that they can begin to understand that the Bible is God's breath. It is the Holy Spirit speaking through the Scripture writers, and it can be trusted and it's profitable in their life. Well, thanks for joining us for week two of Foundations, the Discipleship Community. Hope that you'll join us next week for week three, because uh, week three is asking the question, then what is God like? We'll see you next week.